next on Investigative Report. <coughs> Prior to the pandemic, homelessness was largely an ignored you. issue. You bum. Jobs for most were plenty and the economy booming until the CDC put out its official warning. Well-paid men and women alike began to lose their jobs, their cars, their homes and wealth in exchange for handouts they once passed to homeless people I and condemned doorways. And now, the homeless pandemic. How the COVID virus uprooted millions. Just like the Roaring Twenties prior to the Great Depression of the 1930s, so too was the economy hot just prior to COVID. For the first time in a long time, Americans had expendable income for things such as fine dining until the pandemic hit and many people had to seek soup kitchen dining. Others sought newer income streams by using their cars for rideshare services, while many were added to the roles of the homeless shelters because they could no longer pay their mortgages. Some took on jobs at lower end of the spectrum in things such as fast food while awaiting government help in the form of stimulus payments. To prevent some people from going homeless, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention had issued an agency order that halted evictions for non-payment of rent for renters who met certain criteria. That order went into effect on September the 4th of 2020, and it remained in effect until today. And many of these people have no one to turn to, especially when a pandemic work moratorium has affected anyone you could turn to. We delved into U.S. homeless statistics over a decade and learned that as of the last Great Recession, homelessness had been higher at 647,000 persons and yet trending down all the way into the pandemic lately. Globally, the homeless rate was 100 million at the same time, but as of COVID-19, 150 million, a 50 million increase from the last census. The truth of the matter is that after the rent moratorium has ended in July and the dust has settled, the COVID-19 virus would have been responsible for more homelessness and despair in America than during the Great Depression or the influenza outbreak of 1919 combined. Once the rent moratorium ends on July 31st, 2020, upwards of 10 million renters can face being evicted to the streets for non-payment. Some say as high as 40 million. Now this is a five-fold increase in the worst U.S. economy during the Great Depression in which two million people were evicted in the worst time. Now Congress and the President of the United States made provisions to keep renters in their home and apartments due to COVID displacement when they passed the last stimulus bill that funded the Emergency Rental Relief Act. And this provided about $50 billion between the two plans to renters in need, $50 billion. Now, unfortunately for those renters, the government left it up to the local municipalities to pass it out, which was a bad deal. Now this left a patchwork system across 50 states in which gridlock has only provided relief for 13% of those in need. By all estimates, if most have not received relief in the months since their passage, it is highly unlikely that they will receive relief within 24 hours up until tomorrow. Now, that's when the eviction moratorium completely ends. There are no recycle. Now, let's give you a state. For instance, Massachusetts had to first require rental relief applicants to provide physical copies of birth certificates or social security cards, plus a month's worth of consecutive pay stubs to even qualify for any emergency relief. Now, this forced applicants to track down these documents amid a pandemic created both tremendous hurdles for people and administrating backlogs 
for the state agencies tasked with approving or denying them, which meant weeks or months of waiting for rental relief decisions. Now, if you remember, the government was shut down during COVID. Any local office you had, it was shut down. So this rule wasn't rescinded until late 2020 when the state streamlined the application approval process so that more renters could get help as the pandemic winter began. Now, a recent story uh, is applicable in this case, and that's a Chris Arno of NPR, or National Public Radio, further highlights this story. He writes about Maran Mosadad, who spent much of the pandemic scared and lying awake at night. He's a single dad with a 10-year-old daughter living outside of Atlanta. He says, I get panic attacks not knowing what's in store for us. He says, I have to take care of her, meaning his daughter. Now, Mosadad drives Uber for a living, but the pandemic hit. He stopped because he couldn't leave his daughter home alone because he was a single dad. As a result, he has fallen more than $15,000 behind on his rent, and his landlord has filed an eviction case against him. You're watching MNN, the men's channel. So back in March, when a federal moratorium on evictions was extended, and he heard Congress had approved nearly $50 billion for people to catch up on rent and avoid eviction, most of the Dodd thought help was on the way. <laughs> now, I do believe in miracles, he told NPR back then. It is a relief. Now, most of the Dodd's miracle is evaporating. See, he applied for the federal aid and was approved. But he and his legal aid lawyers say that the county where he lives caps the amount anyone can receive, uh, receive for back rent at about 60% of what was owed, with a minimum of $5,000, which is very generous, it really is, but it's not going to solve our problem, he said. So things are looking pretty ugly right now for him. Now, the problem he has run into is that the government effort to distribute billions of dollars to prevent evictions is looking pretty ugly too, at least in some parts of the country. Now, to further confound renters who were broke, was that the, in the bill was written language that you must be at least one payment behind. But whether the renter is one payment behind or six payments, payments behind, the federal government will only assist them with 60% of that debt for something the federal government was 100% responsible for causing. Now, it would appear that the same local governments that move very fast to shut down the economy moved at a snail's pace to assist the very same people they put on the unemployment rolls. You see, the parents that were forced to take care of children at, or elderly uh, family members or people who had to bury their loved ones who died of COVID. Now, in some towns, it was said that for those who applied for the assistance, it made no sense whatsoever. Why? Why? Because for those who attempted to do the right thing in life, their evictions cleared the courts long before the government began to move on the eviction assistance claims. So one negative beat a positive, it washed. Now, we give you right now the states where you have the highest chance of being evicted tomorrow, followed by the states where you have the lowest chances of being evicted. So the highest chances at number one is South Carolina. Florida would be number two, followed by Maryland at number three. Arizona is number four, Mississippi, five. Georgia is six. Delaware is seven. Kansas comes in at number eight. Ohio is close behind at nine. And Arkansas rounds out the top ten list of places you're most likely to be evicted in. Now, opposite of negative places to be evicted, here are the top ten states you are less likely to be evicted in the United States. Maine is number one. Vermont is number two. Colorado falls behind at number three. Hawaii is number four. Iowa is midway at five. Wisconsin, the cheese state, is number six. California is shockingly at number seven. Alabama is number eight. Oregon, number nine. And rounding off the list of states you are less likely to be evicted from is North Dakota at number 10. Now, the reasons that these renters are not seeing the money fast enough is because the system was designed that way. Trust me, I grew up in Washington, D.C. My mother worked for the government. 
Most federal, local, and state bureaucracy systems were designed to make work. This means that eight people at the minimum were designed to deal with your paperwork before it even got started. Now, this inefficiency in a computer age is a holdover from the government's attempt to give as many people jobs as possible. And if you uh, give a job that assists one person, you need the workforce of eight people in the government's estimation. You're watching MNN, the men's channel. Now, since there was no impetus to streamline the system for decades, the systems collapsed when people needed it and they needed help the most. Now, this turned the COVID relief bill that was meant to help people stay in their homes and avoid eviction and infection from becoming homeless to a shelter where they are sure to get the disease. And, and once those people get kicked out of their homes, they end up getting permanently a history of eviction on their rental record. And you can't have that if you want to rent again. Now, this is not only damaging when trying to rent a house in the future, but in some cases, it makes buying a house impossible. If this number of evictions are allowed to go through, it will make the federal government of the United States the largest realtor in the free world. That's right, the largest realtor in the free world. For it will be the federal government who will be on the line for funding homeless shelters across 50 states and municipalities. And that same government for financing people to get back on their feet in homes like Section 8 housing. The pandemic left many people who were already living from paycheck to paycheck in a lurch. And if they found it hard to make a rent at the inflated rates prior to the pandemic, this cataclysmic event made it nearly impossible. When their ability to pay their rent was diminished through their savings, they went down through their credit cards and maxed them out. And finally they drew on anything they had in the house that they were able to pawn, including valuables, and they did. And that left them with nothing but a government bailout. Some hardworking and honest people let their homes go back to the bank. Other people let their apartments go. And some moved into the homes with distant family members they rarely spoke to in an attempt not to sleep on the streets of America. In an attempt not to become part of the homeless pandemic. Now, in closing, these are numbers to remember before tomorrow. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau estimates that right now, nearly 9 million of the estimated 45 million American households who rent their homes are behind on rent payments. And in December, the Urban Institute estimated that 10 million U.S. renters owed roughly $57 billion in back rent and late fees. Now, I'm sure you heard that this pandemic and this eviction process is hurting minorities and people who have less money more than it's hurting everybody else. That is not a rumor. It is true. Now, a lot of what is happening is that the people who have lost their home from this pandemic are becoming permanent renters for the rest of their life. It's been said that this pandemic has stolen more black wealth than the last housing crisis. You have some people that are staying with their family members out of necessity and not out of love. You have some people that are going without food and their children are going with restricted food. If you've seen a church lately, you might see lines wrapped around a block with cars waiting to get boxes of food from the government. Where that problem did not exist prior to this pandemic. You got people standing in lines at pawn shops trying to pawn things that aren't pawnable. So yes, it does affect the people at the lower end of the spectrum more than it does people at the higher end of the spectrum. There's four categories of people in this country affected. You have the homeless, you have people who are lower income, you have people with middle income, you have people who are extremely wealthy. Now on both ends there's less damage. The extremely wealthy don't have to worry about the basics. Food, clothing, shelter, uh, safety, savings, and medical. They have those things covered. Bottom end of the spectrum, when they're homeless. They don't, these things are not really a concern as well because they have lost everything. I'm not talking people who are going to be homeless. I mean the people who are currently homeless on a sidewalk that you pass by every day. Those people were not maintained prior to COVID. Nobody cared about the homeless. People walked by them on a daily basis. These systems weren't in place before then, or otherwise we wouldn't have this homeless crisis. Now, so on the end spectrum, a homeless person does not have to worry about food because there is a food shelter that feeds three meals a day, three hot meals. They provide clothing, 
a shelter. They provide shelter. A shelter provides safety at night. A shelter, uh, there's a need for savings because when you get the low end of the spectrum, you don't have a savings. You may operate off of a food stamp card or the government may give you a slight assistance. As far as medical, if you don't have any money in this country, you can still go to the hospital in this country and they will still take care of you. So the top end of the spectrum does not have a big problem and the bottom end of the spectrum doesn't have a problem that could actually concern himself with being broke. You're watching MNN, the men's channel. Now the problem that we have is people who are on the lower income spectrum of the ladder. Yet people that are working at McDonald's and Walmart before this COVID process happened and it devastated them when it took place. You have people who are middle income and they lost their jobs, got wiped up, and they moved down the places where you had McDonald's and Walmart and Uber and Amazon delivery. They moved down to those places and those places were willing to accept them. Many, many years in the 90s when I was going to college and I had to work at places like McDonald's. The manager told me, he said, Rivers, he says, we're not concerned about workers. He says, all we have to do is wait for a bad economy and I can get the older people, which they did like, and people with college degrees. He says, that person has a master's degree. That person has a bachelor's degree because in a bad economy, great people who worked hard to make it lose their jobs and lesser industries end up getting that kind of wealth. So for the men's channel, I'm hoping that tomorrow, on the 31st of July, 2021, that you do not have this problem, that you have to insist on the need of a government that did not do anything since January, that we did 13% of people have received assistance, not 100%, 13% out of nearly $50 billion. There's only $57 billion owed in back rent. Out of $50 billion, we can't pass that money out. Is sitting at the state level. So I hope that doesn't happen to you, and we hope to see you again soon. This is Charles Rivers. Thank you for watching.